Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis and I'm your host. The uh, genesis behind this program is uh, after reading many obituaries and wondering to myself, gosh, I wish I got to know that person while they were still alive. Well, this show is all about life and live and, and um, we will bring you, as we have for the last couple of years, people that you may know, some you may not know, but they're all very much alive, I can tell you that. And my, my belief is that everyone has a story to tell. And we have a rich community here with many, many wonderful people who have uh, incredible life stories. And so um, if you're interested in being on the show at some point, please write me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Or if you happen to know somebody, uh, send me a little note and I'll get in touch with them. If you have any questions for the people that I do interview, also write me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com and I'll make sure that we uh, get that question over to the interviewee. Today I want to be, I'm honored to have as my guest Todd Lockwood, who I've known for a number of years in different ways. And um, I'm excited to have you on the show, Todd. Really great to be here, Thank Gary. Thank you for taking the time. It's an, it's an honor. So, we're going to celebrate your life today. <laughs> Great. And, all right. And <laughs> let's, you, you guide us. You take us back and start us where you would like, and, um, and we'll go from there. Okay. Well, I was, uh, I was born in Philadelphia, 1951. Uh, we lived right across the Delaware River in uh, Moorestown, New Jersey, oh, which yes. is down uh, in the southern end of the state. And, um, I uh, lived there until I was uh, six years old. Um, I uh, grew up in a, a, a pretty interesting family. Both of my parents were from quite unusual, interesting families. And uh, my grandparents had a place just a mile down the road from us uh, in Moorestown. Mm. Uh, so I got to spend a, a lot of time with them as a young child. That's a nice and, gift. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so um, those years uh, were sort of setting the stage for things that would come much later. Um, I think uh, my mother probably recognized this first. Um, I, I had a, a deep fascination with things uh, that were electrical. Hmm. And I was mesmerized by the, you know, the lights on the Christmas tree, the electric fan that we had in the, in the living room. Uh, we eventually got a television. We had one of the first televisions on our street, you know, <laughs> with a little, little round screen, you know. And, uh, uh, and I was just fascinated by all this stuff. And uh, so I, you know, I guess I somehow absorbed some of the language of that area of, of, of electrical things. And um, uh, by the time I was five years old, I was actually drawing electrical schematics. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> and, you know, and was really into this, you know. And um, Does this have anything to do with Ben Franklin and Philadelphia? <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but that's possible, I guess. Um, so, uh, and I was, um, I was living in the shadow of an older brother. We, eventually there were five of us mm -hmm. and um, I was number two. And my older brother uh, was, at that time, was clearly the favorite child, you know, which is not unusual right. being the oldest. Right. Um, and, and through our growing years, you know, right through high school, um, he was, doing everything really well that would that would be the normal stuff. He was really good at sports. He was uh, very involved in his student government and so on. There were a bunch of things that he was doing really well. I had no aptitude in any of those areas, <laughs> okay? <laughs> None at all. So I was left, sort of left to my own devices mm -hmm. to uh, just develop my own passions and uh, I, I had to, I guess, find the fuel to keep mm. those fires burning mm. in, mm -hmm. internally. Right. Um, my parents eventually, I think probably when I was around eight or ten, my parents started actually 
encouraging my development in this direction after we moved up to the Albany, New York area, which is where we landed next. Um, what did your folks do, Tom? Well, my, my, um, my father actually worked for a large paper company. It was uh, a company that my mother's father was, um, was one of the three founders oh, of. Oh, my goodness. He and two of his brothers. And um, I, he was, my grandfather was an extraordinary character, an inventor, a very mm -hmm. successful businessman, mm -hmm. a super bright guy. Um, I think my father's first mistake in life was going to work for his father-in-law, <laughs> <laughs> you know, who was a bit of a workaholic uh -huh. and expected the same out of his employees, mm -hmm. sort of the way Elon Musk uh, mm. does today. And um, mm. so there was, always a, there was always a little bit of friction in the family because of that, you know. And here they are living a mile down the road from us in New Jersey. So, right. you know, if, um, wow. you know, during the week, if my grandfather saw my father's car parked in the driveway during the daytime, <laughs> you know, he would, the next time he was home, he'd pick up the phone and call the house and say, what the hell are you doing there, <laughs> you know? How come you're not at work, <laughs> you know? Woo. Yeah, yeah, so, so this, um, this played out, you know, in subtle ways. Um, this, this, you know, stress mm -hmm. played out on on everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was certainly uh, included in that, and um, so I was. I was a, you know, um, uh, an emotional child. Very, you know, I could be set off pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Not emotional in terms of. I was the kid who would. Uh, you know, burst into tears in second grade, sitting there for no particular reason, right. you know, and it was just something yeah. had built up in me yep. Uh, yep. for whatever reason, and, um, and you know, it just sort of would reach the boiling point. But again, my escape uh, and my salvation were these passions that I had. Yes. Yes. And um, so later, later on, uh, the, you know, the passion started to include music. My mm -hmm. um, parents got me an upright piano and had me, you know, playing etudes in the basement mm -hmm. um, every day. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't really like it all that much because the music that I was playing for my piano lessons right. was music that I'd never heard before and I couldn't really relate to it. Right. Uh, we didn't listen to classical music in our house, you know. Right. We listened to Bing Crosby and Frank right. Sinatra, you know? Right, right. Contemporary <laughs> Yeah, music, and if I had been playing, you know, Beatles songs or something, early Beatles on the piano, that would have really got me going, exactly. you know. So um, I struggled through it for uh, f about four years and finally hmm. moved, you know, got, got away from it. Um, also in Albany, um, I, I got through the through my junior high school, I got involved in photography. I, I actually mm. the, I didn't start with a camera. I actually learned to, to develop prints before I um, started using a wow. camera. So I got familiar with the dark room and the various processes and things. Oh, um, my dad had a huge box of old black and white negatives at the house, and he said, "Yeah, go ahead and just take oh, okay. out whatever you want to use in there." You know, so I would take these negatives to school and and print them in the school dark room. Wow. Later on, I finally got a camera and started um, shooting, mm. and um, and I quickly came to the realization that I had a uh, some kind of an aptitude for shooting portraits. Mm. Um, I, I actually began to get uh, commissions to shoot portraits uh, when I was about 15 years old, shooting mostly oh ki shooting mostly kids uh -huh. uh, for various you know families that we knew, mm -hmm. and um, the word would spread around in town that you know hey you ought to get Todd Lockwood to <laughs> do some portraits of your kids he's actually pretty good at it you know wow. and uh, so I I became really uh, comfortable with that and it was a way to um, just a way to connect with people because yeah. I was living um, a somewhat solitary life, you know, mm -hmm. and still. And uh, so uh, that, you know, that portrait 
uh, passions has stayed with me and is still still with me still today. With you, yes. So you, the arts were kind of all bubbling up underneath the surface here. Yeah, yeah. So my mom uh, was extremely creative, uh, just mind blowingly. She she uh, went to Smith College for a couple of years. Then she transferred to the Philadelphia College of Art. Mm and uh, studied art there. And her portfolio from that two years that she was there is just mind-blowing. Mm. You know, these uh, figure studies and things that she did, you know, look unbelievably good. And, um, and so uh, <clears throat> that, you know, she, she, not too long after that, she met my dad and they, they got engaged and she yeah. got married and she, just, she made a conscious decision, I think, to um, make her children her top priority in mm -hmm. life. Um, and so she never pursued a career in art. She definitely could have yeah. as a painter or whatever she wanted to do. Yeah. Instead, she was using that creativity it, around the house, like decorating the house for Christmas was one of her oh, favorite things to oh, do, and it was over the top, <laughs> incredible, a really interesting, interesting stuff. Wow. Uh, she had some uh, toys that she had saved from when she was a child, including a, 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 a Santa Claus that a beautifully crafted Santa that stood about this tall, mm. that would go up on the fireplace mantle every mm -hmm. Christmas with a bunch of these toys. Mm. And, and she commissioned an artist in the Adirondacks to um, do a painting that included all that stuff. Oh my God. So that painting would be up there with the, the Santa and the toys, really? and it would be almost as if those things jumped out of the painting. Right, and we're and there. We're in reality now, you know. So as a child, that was really mesmerizing to see that, you know, like how did, you know, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, it was really amazing. Do you have that painting? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, and the, uh, yeah, I, th I believe it's in my, uh, my younger brother's house oh, uh, down in New Hampshire now, but yeah. Uh, yeah. And so my, my now the, this artistic streak yeah, on yeah. my mom's side, uh, it comes from um, uh, her uh, grandfather was a well-known illustrator back in the, t the turn of the century. Mm. He did a lot of uh, covers for Ladies Home Journal, did oh like 35 goodness. of them actually. Wow. And one of those, probably his most famous one, was the cover of the 1903 Easter issue of Ladies Home Journal, which has this wonderful, very straight on portrait of a rabbit. It almost humanizes the rabbit in a way, you know, My and goodness. it's like staring straight at you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, and so anyway, he, he was a contemporary of N.C. Wyeth, uh, Andrew Wyeth's father. They knew each other quite well, My and uh, they were both in Philadelphia right. at the time. And, um, and so anyway, that, that um, create, creative gene worked its way through the family. My mm -hmm. mother had one sister, and it's the same thing. Same Her thing. sister is very artistic, and she has uh, several, she also had five children, and there's a couple of kids in that family that are also, um, wow. you know, picked it up. Wow. So pretty, pretty interesting. And she saw this in you too, I'm sure. <clears throat> yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I was clearly the one and it, me and my brother Herb, my youngest brother okay. Herb, uh -huh. he also got it, definitely got it. <laughs> he was extremely talented and musical and, and uh, you know, he was a cartoonist and a, hmm. and a, and a poet and uh, he was just a creative guy who tragically died in, in a work accident in Burlington back in 1987. Oh my goodness, really? And um, so we, many years later, um, I pulled together some of his old friends and we created an annual arts prize for the state of Vermont yes. uh, called the Herb Lockwood Prize yes. and that's, uh, that's yes. named after my brother. That's <laughs> what a tribute to your brother. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing you yeah. do. He didn't have the, um, he, had all, he had certainly all the creativity in, in, in him that I have, but, he all, but what he didn't have was he didn't have the, the stressful, uh, family situation. He was uh, mm. uh, five years younger than the next oldest sibling. So he was almost okay. raised separately from the rest of us. You know, yep. by the time um, 
you know, by the time he was, uh, you know, in in middle school, he was an only he was the only kid at right, home. You know, right, right. Um, yeah. The rest of us were off at boarding schools and college and so on. Yep, yep. Um, wow. So, <clears throat> back to the your early days. Did you have um, people that you looked up to, or you kind of tried to fashion your life after a little? Yeah, there were there were a few along the way. I mean, you know, certainly my grandfather, absolutely, because yeah. he was yeah. a he was a uh, he's such a creative, interesting guy, and um, uh, creative in the sense of his creativity was mostly going into business, mm -hmm. and and um, uh, he was one day sitting at his desk. They, he was in the paper packaging business with with his uh, two brothers, mm -hmm. and uh, one day sitting at his desk folding a piece of stationery, origami style, you know, and folds it into what became the top of the milk carton, the pitcher pour spout. Oh. <laughs> that was one of his inventions. Really? Yeah, yeah. Holy. So, man. Yeah. So he was, and and a funny story too. We used to, um, my grandparents used to take us out to restaurants in Philadelphia and stuff as kids. You know, go to ice cream parlors yeah. and stuff yeah. and yeah. and if he saw a waitress um, opening the milk carton by you know sticking her finger in and pulling the thing open that way oh, he you. would oh boy he would give her the what to you know <laughs> and he'd always have in his in his jacket pocket he would have these little flip books that were like a, a something about the size of a pack of matches that was like a little stack of post-its, you know, and you'd you'd flip the thing, and it and you'd see this little animated drawing, hmm. and it showed the correct way to open the <laughs> carton, and so he'd it's give those out everywhere, oh you know, and so you know, um, and the you know it was always fun because the waitress would invariably say, "Wow, you know a lot about this," you know. He said, "Well, there's a good reason for that. I invented it," <laughs> you know. Amazing. Yeah, really wild. So you saw this as a kid. You yeah, saw him. Yeah. Interact with all, the world yeah, and yeah. create, and, and the and the kind of cool thing about my my dad's job, even though you know working for his father-in-law was a risky enterprise, mm -hmm. um, was that he was he was largely an, an evangelist. He would go around to family-owned dairies up and down New York State. He had the the uh, the um, eastern. Uh, strip of New York State from yeah. from Messina down to Kingston wow. and as far west as Syracuse, wow. and he would visit these family-owned dairies, and he'd have to convince the dairy operator to to start doing milk cartons because yeah. everything was still in glass bottles at that point. Right, right. And um, wow. And it involved a pretty big investment on the part of the dairy because the machine that you'd need to to fold and seal the cartons and fill them with milk was a you know like a fifty thousand dollar investment, which mm. back in, you know, nineteen sixty would have been a, a huge, huge amount of money, you right. know. Right. And um, so uh, so my dad was really cut out for this. He would he had a you know uh, he was great at making friends and he had a great sense of humor and and he mm. you know he could ingratiate himself to a dairy operator very quickly. very quickly wow. and he often drove to those dairies in a, a 1938 uh, Cadillac convertible oh, a roadster with a rumble seat this oh white God. classic thing you know <laughs> that wasn't all that he you know he bought it as a junker you know found yeah. it in a barn in Vermont and somewhere and got it all redone put a modern engine in it and so he'd show up wow. at the dairies often in that car which would right away get the owner of the place outside you know, <laughs> you know? what a anyway, business card anyway yeah so so uh yeah so there there was okay. a lot going on you know um <clears throat> i um i can remember as a uh i think when i was 10 years old my parents felt that i was you know, stable enough to be able to to go on a big trip by myself. Mm. So they put me on a on a um, American Airlines jet in in Albany, and I flew all the way to Phoenix to visit my grandparents. They had a wow. winter home out there, wow. and um, uh, and that was that was really an amazing trip. My mother had pinned a a hundred dollar bill to my undershirt just in case I got in trouble I'd have a way to get uh -oh. back home you know? uh -oh. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, there was a dude ranch <clears throat> right next door to my grandparents place in Arizona and um, 
and we did these wonderful breakfast rides with the dude ranch where you'd get you know on horseback you'd ride several you know a few miles out into the desert wow. and where there would be waiting for you this big breakfast spread you know oh my god all being cooked over an open fire and everything you oh know with a God. couple of hands there doing all that for you and it was just awesome you know so so there were a lot of cool memories like that mm -hmm. i remember my grandparents taking all of us kids to uh, disneyland out in california mm -hmm. at one point mm. and um what happened at disneyland for me <clears throat> and also happened to me at the new york world's fair was i came away from those <clears throat> experiences with um, with ideas for mm. things that I could build in my workshop in my in my basement, you know, because that's what I that's where I spent a lot of my time. I'd get yeah. a, back in Albany, <clears throat> I would get home on the school bus, and uh, first thing I'd do is go down to my basement workshop and start building stuff, you know, <clears throat> or start tearing something apart to see how it worked, and yeah. maybe I needed the motors in it or the lights or whatever from this other toy mm -hmm. I needed for another project that I was working on. So, um, so that there was, there was a uh, you know that was a place where a lot of uh, creative generation. things were going on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, you know, I, and then I started building these more elaborate kits that you could get. I built a shortwave radio and where I was able to hear, you know, radio stations from around the world. Wow. And, and I built a little uh, FM transmitter that allowed me to broadcast to uh, nearby FM radios. Wow. <clears throat> and on the front of the instruction manual, it said, <clears throat> According to uh, FCC regulation uh, Part 15, blah, 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 uh, do not, in capital letters, connect this device to an antenna longer than 10 feet, a wire antenna longer than 10 feet. <clears throat> well, I looked at that and I said, well, that, that sounds like an invitation. <laughs> so I strung a 100-foot antenna in the backyard between two trees. No. <clears throat> and I, every day after school, I would turn the thing on and start broadcasting to the near some of my nearby neighbors oh and they my. all knew to tune in you know really? on their fms and uh, and i had a little turntable and it was spinning records i had oh i had maybe eight songs you know <laughs> that i was <laughs> rotating you know and i'd get on there and tell the latest news about what happened at school and what the ride on the bus was like and stuff you know how old were you doing when you were doing this i was probably uh, i was in junior high school so i must Jeez. have been 11 or 12 years old wow. yeah, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, um, and uh, so that you know, th and again, that was a way to connect with people, um, I you know, where I had a little more sense of control, you mm -hmm. know, because mm -hmm. at the same time I was also I had to be looking over my shoulder all the time because I, w the bullies in the neighborhood. They right. could see me coming a mile away, you know. They could sense that I was a vulnerable kid, um, and and mm. uh, so I'd make an easy easy prey for them, you know. So there was always this uh, mm -hmm. balance uh, mm. going on, you know. And, uh, so, and so you get to college at some point here. Yeah, yeah. And so what, what did you major in? Well, I, I to back up just a little yeah, bit. I, I went yeah. to uh, Northwood School in Lake Placid, which is a, a boarding oh, school. Okay. I actually was a day student there, so I would I was living at home because our house we we lived in Lake Placid okay. at that point. We moved up to Lake Placid from Albany full time uh, when the the year I the the summer before I entered uh, ninth grade. Okay. So I entered Northwood. I was a day student there. Um, my older brother had been going to uh, Albany Academy in Albany for his first two years of high school. So he okay. he entered Northwood at the same time I did, but he was two year two years ahead of me. Yep. Uh, which, <clears throat> on, which by the way, sort of continued the legacy that was already in place there. He quickly became he was voted most likely to succeed in his class. He was check captain of the soccer team. He was editor of the the, the school newspaper. Oh you know, it was goodness. it was you know it was hard to compete with that. <laughs> you know, right. so again, that sort of from mm -hmm. experience, I knew the that I should just simply concentrate on my passions yep. 
which are completely different things than than yeah. what he was into, yeah. and not try to compete with that, you know. And uh, so one of my passions that had really taken the route by high school was uh, portraits, shooting uh, yeah. photographic portraits. Yeah. And um, so by the time I got to my senior year, um, I did all of the seniors in my class. Uh, there, were, there were only about 50 of us. This whole school only had maybe 150 students at that point. Um, but I did all the seniors, but did them all differently. I didn't shoot any, they weren't standard mm -hmm. senior shots. For one thing, because there were so few of us, the, the, every, every student in the class got a full page in the book, wow. in the yearbook. Wow. So I had a lot of oh. freedom to work and with the space and try different things. And so um, we've got, you know, a few examples, um, you know, that I can show you of. Would love to see. Yeah, that, yeah. of some of the um, some of the people. There was one where we uh, where I, you know, turned the guy's uh, image into a, into a, um, a connect the dots thing. Oh you my know, goodness! Uh, just a goofy idea, you know, and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there were one, a, a number of them were taken on location in different spots mm. around Lake Placid in the mm. village, you know, with some of the locals sometimes and um, just a lot of different things. I sort of had a kind of a license to, to kill so there, you know, in a yeah. way. And, uh, so and that, that was the yearbooks. Pictures. Yeah. And, yeah. Holy yeah. Man, and I and crazy. I at at the at graduate at, at our graduation, I I won a special award for the for the work I did on that. that. So that gosh. was that was pretty neat. That's phenomenal. But also while I was at Northwood, I had a wonderful English teacher uh, by the name of Bill O'Neill. He he. Um, he, you know, he would be in the, the list of mentors. And when you asked about mm. mentors, mm -hmm. absolutely, because he got me. He recognized that I had a knack for language mm. and for writing, mm. and and he one of the things he did with us I had him all I had him for my first three years as as an English teacher and all three years he did the same thing where every weekend we had to write what he called a theme, which might be a short story it might be mm -hmm. something else but but it, he would give he'd give us some parameters yep. and um, it had to you know it had to be you know 500 words typically yep. and um, so I started cranking these things out. And, you know, he, he was like, wow, he was often using my work as the example for the class and reading it to the class, you know, and I was going, wow, that's, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yes. Yeah. So I was getting some validation there, which was really great. And I, that got me, uh, that added writing to my, to my list of passions, yes. you know. I realized yeah, I've, got a, I've got a knack for this. I ought to do this mm -hmm. once in a while, you know, and uh, maybe even get more serious about it. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got to, so I ended up going to, uh, to uh, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. It, at the time, and this is in 1969, it was the only school um, that offered a four-year uh, program in uh, photography at the time. There are many, many now. There's probably hundreds of colleges that offer uh, Kodak bachelors. Kodak from in Rochester? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kodak once had a, a bit to do with that school. By the time I got there, it really didn't have much to do with it anymore. Right. Um, but it was the only four-year program in the country, and uh, so it seemed like, wow. well, yeah, I guess I want to go there, you know. In years later, I realized that I probably should have been at Pratt or Rhode Island School of Design, mm. or somewhere like that. I should have gone to an art school instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I already knew how to take pictures. I already had a pretty good understanding of the, the technology and the tools and all that. Yeah. Uh, what I needed to learn more of is how to see and, and how to uh, and how to um, conceptualize the work, mm. you know, how to capture a certain thing mm. with a photograph, you yes. know, a certain idea. Yes. Um, you know, I came up with this little thing, you know, in my 20s, I came up with this little thing that went, um, yeah, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, but a uh, but an idea is worth a thousand pictures, Ooh. you know. 
and and it was sort of expressing. I was by the time I got to mm. Vermont, I had a I had a photo exhibition here in Burlington right after I got here, and uh, right after I got to Burlington, and I it was sort of a the purpose of the show, and it was explained in the the write up on the wall that uh, it was sort of my celebrating my exit from photography because hmm. I'd sort of hit a dead end with it. I decided, you know, you know what, it's, the, well, it was that very problem. You know, my, the ideas yeah, that I yeah. wanted to express were bigger than what I could do with portraits, yeah. which is mainly what I was doing right. uh, for, for, for photography. Right. And um, years later, I got back, in fact, 30 years later, wow. I got back into portraits again wow. at the suggestion of my daughter, my 13-year-old daughter at the dinner table one night, you know, <laughs> goes just out of the blue, <laughs> Dad, you should start shooting portraits again. Oh, <laughs> you know, I was like, what? Where did that come from, you know? Wow. So, uh, so she, uh, she, Lit, lit a, a little flame in there that, that really started catching, uh, you know, about a month later. I pulled out my Hasselblad camera and dusted it off and put a sheet up on the wall in the basement and, and, um, and had got my, uh, my younger son, uh, Cooper, who was 10 years old at the time, I got him to, to sit for me and uh, mm. just to, you know, just to do some lighting tests. Yeah. And in that group of test shots is a picture of Cooper that was just so interesting. It, it, there's something about it. It has a, he looks like a, 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 a wiz or not looks like, but your impression is that he's very wise. Even though he's only mm -hmm. 10 years old, mm -hmm. you get this sense of, wow, there's real depth to this kid, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, mm. and that just really got me thinking about portraits again. And so I launched a, a brand new series of work. Again, it was a 30-year wow. hiatus wow. between wow. giving it up when I first got to wow. Burlington and yes. when I started doing these portraits in, in uh, you know, in, in, it, well, it was 1977 versus 2007, wow. you know. <laughs> wow. Um, so I ended up doing a series of portraits where I uh, concentrated on friends, on people I know, because I found that if I knew the person, if I got them in the studio and I knew them, there would be a rapport immediately. Yeah. And they and the person would be more likely to let their real self shine yeah. through, you know, yes. and they wouldn't be putting on some sort of a facade for me, yes. you know. And um, did that and that was truly the case, yeah. yeah. And I even, I, I, and then I did a few people that I didn't know personally, but I thought I could probably work with. For example, I did a, uh, in that series, I did a portrait of Madeline Kunin um, yeah. that she is funny. She, when she, I loved it. She was sort of mm, not crazy about it. She thought it maybe it made her look a little bit old. Um, because I, my, my technique I use is that I'm, I'm actually trying to bring out the, the wrinkles and things, you know, because those are, well, as Richard Abaddon used to say, those, those are sermons on bravado, you know, that, that's, that's real stuff, you know, yeah. that you can't yeah. get when you, when you photograph a 20 year old, yeah. they still have their baby face, right. you know. Those are rings on the tree of life. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so anyway, um, Ten years after I took that um, portrait of, of Madeline Kunin, yeah. she used it on the front cover, front cover of her autobiography. Oh, no kidding! That came out just a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, wow. And and now she looks at that picture and goes, "Boy, I I really like that picture." <laughs> funny, funny about that. <laughs> you know? That's wonderful. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So um, so clearly the the um, you know the portraits uh, have been a, a theme even though I, I backed away from it for a good mm -hmm. period of time during that thirty year hiatus yeah. I I was I got very involved in music I, I uh, when I first right. came to Vermont I resumed playing the piano which I hadn't touched since uh, I was uh, probably eleven and. Um, 
Uh, and, you know, at, at some point, um, I, I, was, I, and I was writing my own little compositions and singing and just really playing hours a day, you know. This started when I first got to Vermont. When I first arrived in Vermont in 77, I actually rented a house down in the Woodstock area, and I lived down there for about a year and a half. But I was coming up to Burlington almost weekly because there seemed to be a lot more going, going on up here, here you know. Yeah. And the, the music scene and stuff here yeah. was was still really bubbling. It, yeah. it, it temporarily died when the drinking age went from 18 to 21 because hmm. most live music was happening in, in bars, of course. Right. But, it, you know, you'd go down to, to Hunt's on Lower right. Main Street and there'd Buzzing. be amazing local bands yes. would be playing in there. Yes. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I, I, um, uh, I was sort of hitting the end of that sweet era before the drinking age dropped. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and back in Woodstock, I had a rented piano initially, and then when I got to Burlington, I finally s sprung for a, a baby grand Yamaha and put it you know, in my apartment. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I actually got the... Um, piano dealer to uh, teach me how to move the piano, how to move this six-foot baby grand piano around. It required just two people. And really? my And my brother, uh, Herb, was living in Burlington at this point. He had moved here. Um, and um, so we could easily have that piano packed up safely in the back of a U-Haul truck in under 15 minutes. Really? Yeah, easily. And, uh, wow. Uh, and then we, anywhere we wanted to go, we could set it up. So I played in, you know, I played in uh, City Hall Park. I played in Battery Park. I played in, you know, the Black Rose Cafe in Winooski, um, on and on, oh. you know. And just did, did, over in Lake Placid, took it over there once. What you kind know. of music were you playing? Uh, you know, it was kind of a, kind of a, um, it was my, all my, mostly all my own compositions. Really? Yeah, with some of them with lyrics, some not. Um, and uh, sort of um, somewhat Neil Young inspired. Mm -hmm. He was definitely one of my favorite songwriters and still is. Um, oh. But there was also, you know, the music that I was around when I was really little was coming through subtly, you know, mm -hmm. the, um, uh, you know, the, the Frank Sinatra or, um, um, you know, just just earlier right. earlier pop music. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so so that um, it got to a point with this when after I got to Burlington, it got to a point where I wanted to start recording my own uh, music, mm -hmm. and uh, so I bought a little bit of recording equipment as people commonly do now, and set it up in my apartment. Well, it got to a point where I started getting calls from other bands in the area who wanted to record their, wanted to know if I could record a demo for them, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and I, I said, well, pff, I have no idea what I'm doing, but sure, come on over, <laughs> you know. And, and so I was learning by doing. I, I didn't have any training in, in, uh, in music recording, but I, but I, I was learning by doing. I also rented time at a, a real fancy studio that at, at the time was down in Sharon, Vermont, out in the woods, was this million dollar studio, this gorgeous studio where a number of well-known bands had recorded. Wow. So I was going down there when they had downtime. I'd go down and, you know, uh, be in there for half a day or something. and. At working on one of my own songs, my and goodness. I would just grill the engineer who, who worked mm -hmm. there. I'd grill him with questions constantly. <laughs> you know, how does that work? How do you do that? How do you plug that in? You know, and I was building a knowledge just yes. from from being in a in a in a really top studio like that. Wow. And um, so I, I was learning. We recorded, you know, in my carriage house apartment in Burlington. On, on this was on Willard Street. Uh, we recorded some terrific albums. Uh, an album for for uh, Pinhead that was quite good. We recorded the End Zones in there. We recorded yeah. Nancy Bevan's album in there. Um, a bunch of projects. Did you have your 
your name of for that studio yet? Um, early, yeah, very early on, I decided we Talk got to about a that. point after a couple of projects, a couple of small projects were done, just demos. I, I said, okay, you know, this is this is turning into something. I gotta give give it a name, you know. So I'm over in. Uh, I just happened to be driving down the north way over in uh, the Adirondacks, and and I pass an albino crow standing next to the guardrail. <laughs> Something you don't see every day. <laughs> Pure white crow. Wow. And I said, that's, there it is. There's the name of the studio right there, White Crow, white crow. White crow and it ended up being White Crow Audio. That's what wow. we called it. And, um, and it stuck. Yeah, <laughs> you know? good name. So, yeah, yeah. Wow. So uh, White Crow, and then White Crow grew. We, you know, uh, eventually, um, I had the opportunity to expand, um, you know, uh, an investment I'd made in, in real estate out in Colorado when I was living out there right, right after college um, uh, finally paid off and I had some money and I thought, you know what, it's time to really do this, you know, really do it now, you know, uh -huh. go, go, big, go to a scale that will attract artists from outside the state. So I rented... Um, uh, an unfinished warehouse space down in the Pine Street neighborhood mm -hmm. and then um, hired an architect and we, you know, put a, a brand new interior in this building wow. and, and built a studio, a real studio, wow. and upgraded all the equipment and everything. And, um, and then by stroke of luck, uh, Fish, who was really starting to, you know, get some traction, mm -hmm. They uh, put their headquarters, their business headquarters, was in a building uh, a block away from us on Pine Street. Oh, my goodness. And they ended up recording their first two albums for Elektra Records with White Crow. Wow. And that was, and that caused a whole bunch of other bands yeah. to want to record with us, bands from Boston and Montreal and Toronto and L.A. and you name it, you know. Wow. Um, wow. So it really grew quickly, and it was it was pretty exciting. Mm. Um, you actually did a we did a project with Alice Cooper at one point, <laughs> which having him in Burlington that was just wild, wow. you know. And uh, did another we did a Christmas album with Odetta, a My wonderful goodness. you know historical wow. figure there. Yes. Um, it happened that um, she brought a bass player up from New York, an upright bass player um, who she had worked with, and it was um, Spike Lee's father, Bill Lee. Oh my <laughs> yeah, goodness. Yeah. yeah. So the you know things were getting more and more interesting just by being um, in that realm, you know, working in that realm. And there's a, wasn't there a local politician that uh, you also? Oh yes, yeah. indeed. <clears throat> so yeah, so we opened in that new location. Um, in 1985, and in 87, things were really starting to cruise along, I started thinking up some ideas for local projects that I could do, and we, we already had a small record label called Burling Town, which um, mm -hmm. I released Nancy Bevan and the End Zones on, and mm. several other projects. They were all local bands, you know, and it was a way to get local music um, involved with the with White Crow at right. this new level, you right, know, which right. they wouldn't have been able to afford to come in there on their own, you know. Right. So we were fronting the studio time just to make the projects possible. Wow. And I was coming up with ideas for projects, and one day I thought, you know what? W what if we, we were having a, a staff meeting at the studio, and I said, what if we got Bernie in here and put a band behind him and had him... <laughs> sing his favorite songs what wow. would that be like you know wow. <laughs> and uh, we i had no idea at the time whether bernie was musical or not right uh turns out he is not only not musical he is <laughs> unmusical <laughs> okay he, he can't he's helpless he can't even tap his foot to a beat you know yeah but we all know he's a he's, he's, an, he's an excellent writer. Yeah, he's a he's an excellent public speaker, and um, so we we capitalized on those mm. things and and sort of blended the music and his uh, speaking ability uh, into a into a thing. You know, so wow. it's almost like rap. You're hearing Bernie talking. Yeah. The, you know. He's talking the lyrics, not yes, singing yes, them. Yes. Uh, but in the Brooklyn accent, of course, right. you know, <laughs> it's right. really effective. And so 
that album, uh, it was only released on audio cassette back in 87. It sold like hotcakes in the area, came out a month before Christmas, and wow. it was like the Christmas gift to get wow. back then, you know, in the air, in the local yeah. area, both by people that love Bernie and people that, you know, were Republicans that would never would have voted for him, right. but they were buying it as a gag present, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, years later, in uh, 2015, Bernie w had not yet announced that he was going to run for president, but I had a pretty good hunch that he was going to. Mm. I could kind of feel it coming. Mm -hmm. So I took the chance, and we remastered that project and, and re-released it on CD wow. and got it out. I believe it was out by Christmas uh, in 2015. Wow. He announced about three or four months later that he was going to run yep. uh, for president and then it just took off nationally uh, it was it was <laughs> a, a snippet from it was played on every major tv talk show all of them sometimes with bernie on there live at yeah, the same yeah, time yeah. you know and sometimes not um yeah the thing just went crazy and uh, and bernie actually hit the billboard charts Really? Under top new artists. Oh my God! <laughs> one, he was number one thirteen, I believe it was, wow. uh, for a for a couple of weeks under top wow. new artists. You know. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah, pretty wild. That is wild. Pretty wild, but. Um, so you know that the the studio uh, play you know as a business it it had in that new location, it had about 10 good years. Mm -hmm. And then I could see the business starting to falter because the nationally, the record business was faltering because of uh, digital downloads mm. and people were, uh, part of this was the record, the record industry's fault by making CDs way more expensive than uh, than 12 inch um, uh, uh, LPs were before yeah, that. Yeah. You know, a typical LP would be eight or nine bucks, and when CDs came out, That's they right. were charging sixteen dollars for right. them. You That's know, right. or twenty dollars right. even. Yep. And it was nutty. They were shooting them. You know, they were they were, and people were saying, "The hell with that. I'm not. I'm not gonna. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna pay that kind of money for for an album." You know, and then and then they would borrow it from a friend and copy it you exactly. know exactly and uh and that's that sort of ultimately killed the the, the industry for a while mm. um you know and it was bands bands like fish uh they came into the business w realizing that there was no money to be made in selling records anymore where the money was really made is in live shows right. so fish started producing right. these fantastic three-day-long right. extravaganzas, you know, right. Right. and making a lot of money doing that. And people were more than happy to pay 150 bucks for a weekend yes. thing, yes. you know. Wow. And um, so it, it was a whole new business model. Fish really was one of the first bands to realize this. They were also one of the first bands to really use the Internet in a big way. Um, the only band that did that before them, I believe, was the Grateful Dead. Mm. Um, it, nobody else recognized this, mm. the power of the Internet yet. And, and Fish had one of the first truly successful websites where they were selling merchandise and, and, and maintaining a, a connection with right. their uh, audience, audience through right. the website, you know. But it was the, but White Crow as a studio started to, yeah, well, I could feel it slowing yeah. down, and I, I, you know, and I, so I, I had to make the tough decision to pull the plug, yep. and, uh, you know, uh, it, it was, I was really sorry to see it go. It was a, it was a cool thing to have it have in Burlington. You know, there's nothing, there was nothing else remotely like it around right. here, and uh, it, it was pretty, pretty cool to have that here. But. Uh, but I, I was sort of facing a re, you know financial reality there, and yep, I yep. really had no choice. Yep. Um, and then you know then the uh, you know other things started filling that gap in my life. You know I had I had I had three kids along right. the way here, um, and uh, I guess when I closed up White Crow, my youngest hadn't been born yet, but the first two had, and. Uh, and, you know, and so my family 
definitely came, became a priority for a while. Uh, well, still is, really. Um, still is a top priority in my life. Uh, my, my kids have really benefited from, from uh, having, a, having a really supportive uh, yes. set of parents, you yes, know. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, uh, so that's, um, that's, that's something I'm really proud of. Do they have that creative gene in them, any one of the three? Yeah, well, my, so my, my older son, Foster, my first, he, uh, by the time he was four years old, he was pretty fluent on the Mac, on the Mac computer. Mm. I mean, he was mm. really cranking, you know. And then while he was uh, at Burlington High School, Without even telling his mom or me, he went and took a he took a couple of pr pr uh, courses in writing C plus plus at, um, at at Vermont College, you know, and um, on his <laughs> Vermont Community College on his own, you know, oh my goodness. and uh, and so by the time he got to college, he went to Tufts. Uh, he was, you know, getting pretty good at all this stuff, and was already beginning to uh, write apps for the iPhone, wow. and uh, and had a really good run at um, at, uh, at at Tufts. But when he was at, at a BHS, uh, he and a few of his friends started a co-ed a cappella group hmm. that still exists. At, really, uh, it's called the Burlingtones. And it's still, they still have it there. They just replace the, the uh, students that graduate, right, you know. Right. And Foster was, was one of the wow. founding, founding members of that group. My daughter was, was also in the Burlingtones. Hmm. She was uh, th th three years great behind name. him. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. They were great. They were really great. So he ended up in the, uh, he got accepted into the, the um, co-ed uh, a cappella group at Tufts which is wow. big time. Then yes. you're dealing with like the Ivy wow. yes. level right. a cappella, which is very, very competitive. Right. And um, there were, there were um, 200 people, when he was a freshman trying to, you know, <clears throat> applying to get into that group, there were 200 other people trying to get in. There were only four openings. Wow. And he managed to um, one score four. one of those openings, yeah. And, and, and so at the little, gathering where they announced who the new members yeah. were they handed him a sheet of paper with the um, with the lyrics to the national anthem on he said you got to learn this by Friday we're singing li on live on national television at Fenway for a Red Sox game <laughs> that was his first gig with them <laughs> Isn't that great? that's great <laughs> believable oh geez and uh, then my daughter Anna she she went to uh, NYU um, she went to the Gallatin School there, where you design your own your own major, basically, wow. and you you come up typically with three different areas of study, and that are usually not related to each other. And you um, you're what you're trying to do is defend the idea that these things are related, mm -hmm. and that's what you ultimately write your thesis on, is how these areas are related. So her three areas were comedy, uh, writing. And women's studies, wow. those three things, yeah. and um, so she got involved in the um, uh, the sketch comedy group at NYU, which also is pretty big time. You know, they Jeez. they get they get audiences that include a lot of people that are outside of NYU. In the city, you know, yeah. and uh, uh, and she was in, not only in the group as a performer, but she because um, she had been in a bunch of plays at, at BHS, so she had some stage experience. Um, she was not only a performer, but she wrote a lot of the material, and um, and so that uh, that was pretty amazing. I was going down every time they had a show. I'd go down there. Uh, I'd fly down on on hop on JetBlue and go down to the city to to right. see their show. You know, right. and um, it was just amazing. And uh, and then my youngest uh, Cooper, he. Um, uh, he he is interesting. He had a very different situation at BHS. He was not into theater, uh, he, and he wasn't into music. He really had a he had his own passions. This was sort of like me growing yes, up. Was, you know, it, had his own passions. Exactly. And he had a small group of very close friends. Where Foster and Anna both had big yep. big uh, communities of friends, um, and he and one of his buddies. 
uh, junior year, they both made the decision to go into the Marine Corps, wow. which is wild because wow. I never served in the in the armed right. forces, and uh, right. and neither did you know my my dad did, but but uh, in terms of my generation, none of my siblings did either, and so this was like all new territory, mm -hmm. and uh, so he went. So my uh, Cooper went into the Marine Corps uh, about. Um, uh, I think it was about a year after graduation. He um, from BHS. Yep. Uh, he he worked construction before that, and and did some other did some traveling as well. Did some world traveling. Mm -hmm. got him, we got him on a couple of adventure tours with other, where you go with a group of yes. of uh, Young people. kids your yeah. your age, yep. you know. And um, so he already had a little bit of international travel experience under his belt before getting to the Marines, which was great. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, he, uh, uh, he ended up, you know, after the Marines, he ended up uh, deciding uh, construction was something he was really mm -hmm. passionate about and really interested in. He, um, so he ended up majoring in construction engineering uh, wow. at Cal Poly out in California. Wow. Uh, he just graduated this May. Wow. And uh, and got he he got hired immediately by a large construction company mm -hmm. uh, based in California, and wow. he's off and running. <laughs> so, yeah. Good job, Dad. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm super proud of all three of them. You know, uh, they're, just, just, they're 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 really great. People, they're yeah. really wonderful yeah. people, and uh, and I'm so ins you know I'm just so inspired by them. You know, I'm, it's pretty wild to think because I always I was, I knew I know I was inspiring them when they were younger. Yes, uh, but to have them inspiring me now yes. is just wild. Yeah, yes. I didn't see that coming, and it's really <laughs> <laughs> it's really a great. I think of that thing. your daughter at 13 saying, "Dad, photography." Yeah. I, I, there you go. Yeah. 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 My mom had passed away uh, about a, six months or a year be before that, and mm. before Anna c came out with that. And, <laughs> and I often thought that it might have been some way or other it was my mother speaking through her, mm. you know, uh, <clears throat> because my mother would have loved to have seen me go back to that. She yeah. always loved my portraits. She never thought I, she thought mm. I never probably mm. should have gotten away from it, yes. you know. But it, it it had run its course, you know, and I um, I really, um, you know, write. I did a lot of writing after I, you know, when I got to Vermont, when I, while I was down in Woodstock, that first those first yeah. year in Vermont, I I was uh, writing uh, sh uh, short stories and getting them published in a in a uh, Arts Weekly over in the Adirondacks, and um, uh, and really enjoying it, you know, and really finding it, you know, inspiring. Yeah. And, uh, and I've, I've done, you know, I've been doing some fiction writing uh, in, the, in the recent years up here. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm, I intend to keep that, That's amazing. keep that going too. So we're near, near the end of our show, but um, a question for you. Yeah. <clears throat> a couple of questions for you. One is, <laughs> with all these different creative pieces to you, writing photography music do they do you ever get in a, a situation where which one do which road do i go down do you ever or do, or do they seem to just fall in place as the next yeah thing? they they seem to coexist pretty well mm -hmm. now you know I, for, I i do remember at points in the past feeling like i need to do one thing you know mm -hmm. I, did, I, I thought maybe i was a victim of of being, a, you know, a, a jack of all trades and a master of none, you know, right. and and I, uh, I, I think I've come to learn that it's really all, it's all the same thing. It's just different ways of expressing it. Yeah, you know yeah. that it's. Yeah. I have this, yeah. you know, wealth of experience now to draw on. Yes, and uh, and I can put that out. In any language that I want, That's the you know the electrical schematics that I was drawing when I was five years old, right. that was a language. Mm -hmm. You know that was a, a a language that I had yeah. somehow absorbed. Yes, and I was able to speak that way. Yeah. You know yeah. on paper and uh, 
And then I think my, my sort of innate writing ability, I never, well, again, I studied, the only place I studied writing was, was in high school. And um, I think that was largely um, from my mother who read to us like mm. a lot when we were young, when we were really, lo really little. Wow. We'd be on the couch with her and she would be reading us stories. And it wasn't just reading the same book over and over and over right, either. She right. would have different things, you know, and, wow. and, you know, and, uh, yeah. and it was just, a, you know, uh, I think it, it was building that language muscle exactly. in, inside of me, you know, exactly. and, um, uh, being able to, uh, to, to, you know, speak in, in, in a, in a printed, in a printed word, you know. Right. Well, um, any words of wisdom that you want to share with the audience about life? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, my advice would be, um, to, to young people especially is, um, find your passion and stick with it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be just one thing, mm -hmm. but whatever it or they are, um, stick with it mm -hmm. and keep digging. D you know, um, time is is the thing you can't control, but it's the most important thing. Mm. You know, if enough time goes by and you're still you're still passionate about something, you're going to get good at it. Yeah, you're going to get really good at it. Yeah. Um, and that only happens if you stay in the game, you yes. know. So I think it's uh, super important to, uh, you know, stay, stay with it. Right. You know, I felt a little bit conflicted growing up because I, I often felt like I had to make businesses out of my, my creative passions, mm. which sometimes got in the way, you know, trying to make money at right. something isn't necessarily the best Right. Always the best way to go. Sometimes it's better to be working an ordinary job to support your art. Yes. So you can then not have to compromise. Put that much you. pressure on that. that right, yeah. and not compromise your art. Uh -huh. You know, Interesting. It depends on who you are and what your situation mm -hmm. is. But um, uh, if we have just another minute. I'd yes, please. This go. is an amazing story. Yes. A guy that I went to elementary school with in Albany. Mm -hmm. We were in the same class from first, second, third, fourth grade. We became good buddies. We lived in the same neighborhood. And, um, uh, and he in, in um, after, you know, and then we sort of lost track of each other when we got into high school and stuff because we went off to different, you know, I went to Northwood and he was in school down in Albany and so on. Um, he became a, a very proficient hockey player. And his father had been a professional hockey player. Hmm. So the, so the, it was all pointed toward hockey. You know, there was no question this guy was going to be an, you know, yes. an NHL player at some point, you right. know. And, um, so he went to, he was going, he went off to a, a New England boarding school and was on a full hockey scholarship and so on. He got to his senior year and he couldn't figure out what he wanted to major in in college. And his parents were insisting, even as good as he was at hockey, they were insisting that he keep his education going and mm -hmm. you know, go to college, study something, you know. So, but he couldn't figure out what he wanted to uh, major in. And, and during that senior year, he had one required art class. And um, the teacher, the first day, handed everybody a sheet of white paper and a pencil and put a vase of flowers or something up on the front table and said, go ahead, give it your best shot. I know most of you have never done this before. So he just starts, you know, he's just not even trying. He's just sort of almost scribbling on the paper and creates this masterpiece. <laughs> Oh he didn't know he had this. He wow. said, how did I know how to do that? Wow. You know, wow. and, and the teacher looked, looked at it and said, young man, you're looking at your future right there. Wow. So he went to Bowdoin, majored in fine art, still played hockey because that got him a scholarship. Mm -hmm. The hockey got him a scholarship at Bowdoin. At Bowdoin, right. But there was a famous artist in residence at Bowdoin at the time, um, and and this I forget the artist's name, but he was from New York City. And he he as soon as he saw what Steve was capable of, he took him under his wing, wow. you know. And uh, 
and said, you know, I'm going to work with you. And then, so then he, after there, after Bowdoin, he uh, got a master's in painting at Smith. Oh my God. He was, and amusingly, he was the only <laughs> male student at Smith at the time and a, and a pretty good looking guy. So it was a pretty interesting situation there. But he, same thing happened. There were two sisters teaching at Smith who were both well-known painters. Mm -hmm. And they, they, once they saw Steve's work, they, you know, they, yeah. they took him under their wing yeah. as well. Yeah. And they just wanted to make sure he didn't do anything <laughs> dumb and head off and so on some side road, you know, right. that wasn't going to go anywhere and encourage him to strengthen certain aspects of his, of his eye, his ability to see and so on. And, um, and so by, you know, by, uh, gosh, uh, probably within 10 years of graduating from Smith, I'd say, I think it was maybe eight years, he had his first solo exhibition in New York City in, um, in uh, Soho. Wow. And, um, uh, and, it, and he's a landscape painter. So he was doing landscape at a time when it was <clears> the <throat> last thing you'd want to be introducing in New York City. Mm -hmm. was, nobody else was doing landscape in the 80s. It was like, why would you do landscape, you know? <laughs> and, um, but he stuck to his guns. Right. He stuck to his guns. He didn't let the prevailing wind blow him off his, yep. his, his passion, you know? So he stayed with landscape. He is now considered, I mean, and for some time, has been considered one of the most important painters in, in, in the U.S. <laughs> And has works, wow. and in, uh, he has, you know, he has ten, <clears throat> and he paints huge. These are, these some of these paintings are ten feet wide, you know, wow. and they're magnificent. Wow. They're just incredible to look at. Unbelievable. His name is Stephen Hannock. I was going to ask yeah, you. Yeah, and he lives down in the Berkshires. He has a big studio at Mass Mocha down there, and um, he's represented by the Marlboro Gallery in New York, which is the top commercial gallery in New York City, you know, and... Uh, and it just took that one class. Yep, yep, and... Um, Unbelievable. And, and so he's, uh, yeah, he's in... So we're... St his, it just happens his daughter went to UVM and just graduated this year. So for the past four years, oh he's been up here a lot, and we've gotten to r sort of rekindle reconnect. our... Reconnect. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's been fantastic. <laughs> and uh, really interesting life he's had, you know. Wow. Just fascinating, Todd. absolutely fascinating. This has been a wonderful session with you. Yeah, really. I really, really, really appreciate it. We haven't even talked about the Brodigan oh, Library. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah right. I have to do a, a part two yeah, here. Okay. But thank <laughs> right. you so much you for this. Very good. Thanks. <laughs>